Welcome to another spiritual encounter with the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries. What are we seeing happening on the world stage today? Are we truly watching the Middle East primed and ready for another major war? Could this indeed be the last Pope? And what part will the Vatican actually be playing with its team of astrophysicists through Project Lucifer? Will we witness the prophecies of Revelation 17 and 18 help bring in a one world religious system? Do we already have a one world government in place that fulfills the ancient biblical prophecies? Is America prepared for another attack on its soil? Will the UK trigger an economic collapse? Will the Nephilim, will they return or are they already living among us today? How will the transhumanist movement impact us and our children? And what will it take for a nation to repent and turn a heart back to God so he can heal and restore its people? When will full disclosure take place about the UFO manifestations? As they appear to be increasing and not going away. And how should we deal with the numerous accounts and all the witnesses who claim to have had contact with these extraterrestrials? Are they actually superior intelligent life forms from another galaxy? Or are they demonic interdimensional spiritual entities masquerading as extraterrestrials? Why did the Holy Scriptures warn us about a coming great deception? Are we truly living at the end of the age? What did the Lord Jesus mean in John 14, 12 when he said, This and greater things shall you do in his name? Does God still perform healing miracles today? If the Shroud of Turin has now proven to be genuine, is it like a receipt that Jesus left us saying, Paid in full? If God means what he said and said what he means, should we just simply obey him? When will the rapture happen? Will we, in fact, be the generation since Israel came back together as a nation that sees the return of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Messiah Yeshua, in all his glory? Won't you join me now, your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper of the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries, as we discover together the answers and continue to love God, love all people, minister healing and miracles in the almighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah! Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters. Um, this is actually part two with Richard Shaw. Um, we're going to continue where we left off last time. Um, we've got lots of things we want to cover tonight. So, so glad you tuned in. Richard, um, we were just talking about things that lead up to the mark of the beast. And, and the scriptures have a lot to say about people that were marked in the Old Testament. And the enemy continually counterfeits whatever God does. And uh, somehow we're seeing this connection now. Um, the, the pieces of the puzzle come in together here with the, the mark of the beast. Well, yeah, I was just thinking about it yesterday. You know, there's an old movie called The Ten Commandments. Remember that? Mm -hmm. With Charlton Heston <laughs> way back in 1956. And a lot of it's pretty goofy, but there's some interesting things in it. It just reminded me of the whole Passover scenario and also the when... Well, they have like this green fog that comes through the town that, that kills all the firstborn in Egypt, which is why the whole Passover blood on the doorpost was necessary to avoid that. But it got me thinking because I had been studying in Ezekiel and I had just done a uh, conference at the Prophecy Conference in Orlando just a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that I talked about was Ezekiel 9 where, you know, they had this death squad that comes out and kills everyone in Jerusalem except for the ones that are marked. So then I'm thinking, well, here we go again. Um, like the first time that happens is way back in Exodus where the Passover occurs. Mm -hmm. And so if you have the mark, you're saved from being killed. And it happens again in Ezekiel 9. You have a mark and you're saved from it. And then fast forward way into the into Revelation, and I believe, if I remember correctly, that the 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel are marked, they're sealed, it says. So there's like another instance of it. 
So then we have the the um, uh, the Antichrist who comes in and and does a mark on people's foreheads or on their wrists, uh, which everyone calls the mark of the beast. Uh, I just think it's it's an interesting ploy that people will think this is a good deal because <laughs> that's the way it's always been before. But in this case, it works the opposite, which is really typical of the way the dark side works. Anyway, that's what I was thinking about for some reason <laughs> over the past couple of days and being that, uh, you know, this is Good Friday. Right. Uh, that all kind of came to mind. I thought this um yeah it, it when we look at everything that's going on here i'm I, you know I'm reminded that Satan wants to give us a bloodless religion because a bloodless religion has no real power of salvation, and that's really what we're seeing the world doing right now they they're, they're trying to you know blend as many religions as they can because the, the scriptures warn us that there's this going to happen a one world religion with one world government and i mean the agenda here is is clearly happening before us um i could see how this agenda is setting up uh at some point convince people you know well if we had one religion you know like tony blair kind of propagating this sort of stuff um then all the wars and fighting would stop people would all get along right um, well it's like the pope just called into the U.S. and is trying to unite the Protestants in the U.S. with the Catholics there in the mm -hmm. Vatican, and uh, that was a pretty profound thing, and the uh, Pope has never done anything like that before that we know of. And, of course, what's really unusual today is that we've got YouTube, which is propagated pretty much worldwide, and it's a format that any computer or mobile device can play now. And so we can we can see things almost instantly. Like this morning, I call up my my email program, and and up comes a 7.2 earthquake in Mexico City. I mean, we just know about things as you know exactly when they happen. That's really that really hasn't been that long ago since we weren't able to do stuff like this. This is really happening quickly. So it is. You know when I, I think. When the scriptures say every eye will see him and makes comments like that, we're talking about a, a global interconnected world where uh, everybody can see what's going on as it happens live, streaming on the Internet or whatever else in the next few years that we have that supersedes that. But mm. I think what's going to happen is that streaming will become much better than it is now and all these uh, – networks that that we have out there that are giving us internet internet service providers isps are going to be much faster than they are now some of them especially out here in california are abysmally slow for doing the kind of stuff that you really need to do and that has to change there there are those people i think um when we were at the conference with you in orlando i, I I don't remember who it was now, but one of the people um, lecturing it talked about uh, a plan to take away the internet, you know, to regulate it, um, take away the freedom of expression on the internet. Um, do you see that kind of playing into this as well? Could well, it could definitely. I mean, there there is a uh, – I, I don't know how many people know about this, but there is a move from uh, the FCC – to basically capture all of the UHF television channels above channel 30. And they see the shift in television going to the Internet. Well, the Internet is, could be somewhat controlled. It would be very difficult, but it could be somewhat controlled. But it's, it's harder to control a TV signal coming out of an antenna. You don't know who's all picking it up, and it's... It's still a great medium if there is a disaster or something. Everybody can, whether their Internet's working or not, if they've got an antenna and a battery, they can pick up a signal. But And the Internet is so fragile most of the time mm -hmm. that you can't really do that. But here we have the FCC because I attended a broadcast meeting a couple years ago where they wanted to, to uh, retain all frequencies above Channel 30. That would basically put 
about 125 UHF television stations out of business, hmm. which I thought was alarming. It is alarming. Um, I recall that it like, was in the 60s in, in, in England off the coast. There was um, some ships, you know, that were broadcasting against the, you know, what the government um, sanctioned. They were out, outside the range of the ability to do that. Um, so I don't know if something like that would happen today. So. Well, back in the 60s and 70s, there was a huge push for ham radio operators that had their own little broadcasting radio systems in their homes, and some of them had big antennas in their backyards and linear amplifiers where they could broadcast a 1,000 watts across the country. Um, you had to have all kinds of licenses, and a lot of people did it illegally. You don't see that anymore because the Internet has pretty much taken over everything. You don't have to wonder what's going on in Moscow by having a big antenna in your backyard because you can just pull it up instantly and watch RT television or whatever on the Internet. So people couldn't have conceived in those days of the technologies that we have now and how the governments want to control everything. A, a good example of that is um, the currency called Bitcoin that um, has had a little rocky road the past few months and some of that is because of government regulation. The, uh, Bitcoin is a, uh, it's a cryptocurrency. Uh, essentially, it's, a, it, it's all done on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And if, if, any, if you've studied about it at all, one Bitcoin has vacillated in price from about a year and a half ago. was $18 to at its peak of $1,100 in value. This is what kind of got everybody interested in it, thinking that this Bitcoin might be a shelter if the dollar fails because it wouldn't be connected to any government and it's global and people could invest in it or not. It's their free will what they want to do with it. Well, now the governments have stepped in and China put a big monkey wrench in it the other day. Uh, wanting to regulate Bitcoin and other other countries of are trying to make it illegal, even though it's an internet-based currency. Hmm. Yeah, I, I did see some coins that uh, um, were encoded with a uh, device that uh, has a phoenix on it, which the, the the model of it that's supposed to be coming out, um, an intelligent coin. So that, yeah. I think there's all sorts of things that are coming on the horizon. I think um, Iceland is coming out with, I forget what they call their coins, but I think they're also coming out with an alternative to Bitcoin. And, of course, Iceland has set up its own. They went through a kind of a national bankruptcy and got rid of all the bankers and restructured their government, and now they're doing pretty good. <laughs> so, yeah, um, interesting I, I've been to, watch to Iceland. That it's a really weird country. But <laughs> <laughs> It's strange. It's like you wake up, it's four in the morning, it's totally bright outside, and you're going, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does sound a little unusual for us. They're not used to that. Um, yeah, and then in the wintertime, the sun hardly comes up at all, so it's like dark most of the time. It's really mm -hmm. dreadful. Um, I did want to ask you some more about um, the UFO phenomena because you're so immersed in that at this point with the Watchers series, um, maybe you could expound a bit more on the alien technology that um, is unfolding and how that kind of connects maybe with the Mark of the Beast here. Oh, sure. So, uh, and, in reference you know, to implants. Yeah. So. Well, implants are, are definitely interesting and are provable scientifically. I mean, to, I guess to a lot of people this would seem like the most fanciful, ridiculous discussion in the world. However, I have held one in my hand. I've been in the lab when we put it under electron microscope and searched this thing, and there's nothing I've ever seen that looks like this. Now, I, I'm not a scientist. I don't profess to be one. I'm a filmmaker, but because of being a filmmaker, I have associated with a lot of really brilliant people um, and have been able to go pretty much around the world because of the job that I have. And these implants are definitely interesting and 
they apparently aren't from this world. And the reason why we say that is that there is a, a certain percentage of uh, metals that, you know, if you, if you buy a bicycle spoke at a shop, that spoke is going to be made of a particular kind of steel or whatever that's only produced in, uh, on the earth. Or, you know, if you, if you get a, a, something that has a, a content of iron and nickel together uh, that, that's smelted that way, then it, it's going to have a, a particular uh, signature to it that, you know, maybe it was manufactured for Home Depot or something like that. And we, we can tell those things now by using EDX analysis in the lab to see what, what the percentages of these elements are. Well, when we put an implant into the same test, we get uh, iron and nickel compounds as well as oxygen, titanium, and other elements that are more readily apparent in a meteoric particle. So to be finding that kind of an object under the skin and in, in, in several people's bodies uh, and also apparently uh, with some of these implants are, are in, have carbon nanotubes embedded in them, that is a technology that... that I don't think even black ops programs uh, that are going on secretively have that technology yet. I think that's something that uh, we're, we're seeing an alien technology, if you will. So we're um, basically talking about Second Thessalonians, um, according to the scripture, the great deception that's coming. Um, i seeing things. This we we talked about um, in the other interview we did, part one. And we talked about some of the work you're doing with LA on the elongated skulls. Um, how how would you kind of condense it? Because there's people now trying to say that the skulls. Uh, first of all, why are we only finding skulls and not the remains of the bodies? And uh, oh, how, there's how, there's there's yeah. bodily remains too. Just the skull is the most interesting part. So on on, on the skulls. Um, how are the, the evolutionists are going to fight back to trying to tr justify the discovery now? Because, um, but maybe if you can kind of give a simple overview of how this really dismantles evolution. Oh, sure. Could could I uh, before I, I get into that because that's a, a big conversation. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say about implants, if if okay. you don't mind. Of course. Um, one of the things was that we discovered uh, because of Dr. Lear's research. Um, is that implants were encased in a oh, I don't know what to call it. it's a coating it's like a little sack sometimes it's a grayish milky colored material and the interesting part about it is that you sometimes you can't cut through it with a scalpel and yet what this this coating seems to do is to prevent inflammation so the body doesn't reject it. Because normally if you get a sliver or something, your mm -hmm. body eventually pushes it out. Well, that's not the case with an implant. The body apparently doesn't know it's there. So I know that uh, my good friend L.A. Marzulli, who is, is my partner on the Watcher series, has a tendency to believe that this technology is Mark of the Beast technology. And I've talked to him about it recently, and I said, you know, it, it could be, and I'm not saying that it's not, because it's so more advanced than we have a good understanding of at this point. However, in the Revelation, it talks about the people that took the mark got grievous sores. Remember that? Yes. And people that have a alien implant if you if you will don't seem to have that happen in fact the most recent one that we had uh, removed for watchers 8 it was implant number 17 that dr lear uh executed the removal on along with dr matriciano uh, in in westlake village at a uh, medical center there where we did the surgery and all of this is on camera and will be in watchers 8 but uh when the lab did tests on the coating that, that surrounded you know, this implant, the tissue surrounding it, they found in their results no inflammation, 
no bacteriological issues, and no infection. Wasn't there also no place of entry? Yeah, that's a, a common thing with implants. No, uh, Dr. Larry is always used to yeah. you call it, no, there's no portal of entry. Um, even using a magnifying loop, they couldn't find any place, an incision or anything like that where it went under the skin. Uh, we had to make a big incision to get it out, but they didn't have to make an incision to put it in, evidently. So I, I know from my discussions with you on and LA and, and privacy that um, we think this is changing DNA, and, and it's a prototype of maybe what's coming as the mark of the beast. I I think it could be. I think that it may be that it that they're. I mean, this sounds really crazy, but maybe at the highest levels of world governments, they're getting the knowledge they need to make these implants. I don't think they'll be alien implants, but I think that we may be instructed on how to make them. Mm. And maybe what happens is that we don't know how to make the coating because the coating, we don't know where that comes from. If it emanates from the metals, that doesn't make sense because it's like a semi-organic coating. Um, so, it's very strange. So if it, if we don't have the coating and, and the, the implants become inflamed, then to me that's what the book Revelation is talking about. That's just an opinion. I can't prove any of this, and we're way off here and some really crazy stuff. So, you know, it's just speculation on my behalf. Well, we, we are on fringe radio. Nobody would be listening to us unless they were interested in this. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of this stuff is, I mean, people wouldn't I, believe the job that we have doing watchers. It's its crazy. I mean, we're really discovering some just bizarre stuff, and I have to sit there and scratch my head half the time as I'm running the camera and asking questions and getting people set into the shot and going, okay, uh, let's do that again. These are alien Alien fingerprints, okay, well, let's try to get that ultraviolet light over here a little closer then. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I mean, some of this stuff, I'm not even sure how to shoot it because it's just so bizarre. I so. I think it, it just seems surreal. I mean, I, I know it just personally from times I've, I've ministered and prayed for somebody and God's done some sort of supernatural healing, you know, healed somebody from an accident or some medical condition. I mean, at the moment it happens, it does seem a bit surreal, um, but, you know, we serve in a supernatural God, and all things are possible with the Lord. So, you okay, Richard? You just fell off of its stand. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for that. Ouchie, yeah, okay. I'm putting it back in here. Like I was reaching for a... It had one of those creeping uh, things where it would constantly be sagging as I'm talking into it, and it finally just <laughs> fell off. So I got a screwdriver out and I tightened it, so it's fine now. Sorry, guys. Oh, right. So here was the you're talking about the substance that the technology we probably don't really know if if in fact it's some sort of extraterrestrial thing. So and you alluded to the government maybe you know looking to advance this sort of technology um, with whatever this gray matter substance is that that doesn't have any inflammation. Um, so do you think that maybe playing back into that whole Nephilim idea where perhaps government world leaders are exchanging you know, women for Nephilim exchange like we, we see in, in, in Genesis 6-4? Well, that's a hard, hard question to answer. It, it seems to me that history has repeated itself over and over again and a lot of it has remained secretive. And, and that's why, like for Watchers 8, I've entitled it Cloak of Secrecy because the whole Nephilim thing uh, has been kept secret. It's, it's, it's like a worldwide conspiracy to not study about the Nephilim. Mm. And uh, Paul McGuire made an interesting statement in the open of Watchers 8 that we're working on now that he felt like the Darwinian case is collapsing, mm -hmm. but the scientists can't say that. But their case is so full of holes and so ridiculous in some areas that um, I think that um, a, a lot of the, the producers out here in Hollywood, uh, I don't know if they embrace Darwinianism, but I think uh, 
really what uh, probably the majority of them think that we were seeded here by some other race, by aliens in the past. And I think that that to them makes a lot more sense than we emerge from some primeval goo. <laughs> you know, it's like right. Well, it, that it, kind of goes back to that that question I asked you a little while ago about um, how does this kind of fit together with with people with elongated skulls, with you know, people that are basically into the Darwinist camp. I, I, I want to defend their, their place and they're going to say, well, the extraterrestrials, it's proof the extraterrestrials are the ones that started civilization. We're, we're, we're seeing it more scripturally and, and going, this fits the, uh, the scriptures pretty well. That these are not um, quite human. And um, Well, yeah, exactly. And I mean, basically what, if we look at the Bible as a historical book and we strip any religious connotations out of it, say we're just looking at it coldly from a scientific standpoint, then we could go back into Genesis 6 and say, okay, some beings from outer space came to Earth and mated with the women, and the, the result of that were these enormous giants that populated the Earth for we don't know how long, two, three hundred years perhaps. That's a long time. Uh, it was during the time of Enoch, it was during the time of Methuselah, um, it was just before the flood, um, and then the flood came and wiped them out. And then we see them making a, a, a second incursion uh, around the time of the Tower of Babel, and you, you, you hear about David and Goliath and all this stuff, and Goliath is this giant, but he's probably half the size of the giants that were around before the flood. And then those are wiped out, and we have these passages in Scripture where Saul was supposed to wipe out this whole uh, uh, race of people, and he, he spared some of them, and Samuel was was really angry, and, and the king was standing there before Saul, and he hacked him in pieces before the Lord. And you're thinking, what is that all about? Why is God such a bloody, merciless God? I mean, you know, puts it up with... It makes schizophrenic, you know? Yeah, it makes God seem like he's really, like, really dire. I mean, you don't want to mess around, you know, and, and so there, therefore we get this very strange um, impression of God being a vicious uh, guy that puts up with, uh, you know, no foolishness, you know, or, or you'll be hacked in pieces. And that really, apparently, what wasn't going on at all in that passage, it was it was uh, a Nephilim race that had to be extinguished, soulless individuals that were basically hybrids. Now, we can use the term hybrid today, and people know that that means half of one thing and half of something else. Well, that's what the Nephilim were. Nephilim weren't angels. They were, they were hybrids. They had half human DNA and half fallen angel DNA. And so... Or you, in today's vernacular, you might call it uh, alien DNA if you want to. So then we see uh, this happen over and over again. So now when we're down in Peru, uh, this was a very recent um, incursion where we have skulls that are elongated um, that do appear to be hybrid between human and something else. I mean, these are very strange-looking heads. I mean, they're huge. And there's two kinds of elongated skulls. There's the kinds that we kind of call them the cone heads that are you, know, you can will see in the Chongos graveyard in Peru, and, and those are really tall heads uh, with 30% more interior brain mass than a, a standard skull would have. And, and then you've got like kind of the heads that are elongated and go back. So their heads like hang out over their back. Very strange looking. And you'll see like uh, carvings of Egyptian gods and things like that that look like that. And all these things uh, I think stem back to their source of Nephilim hybrids. 
So if we look at it from that standpoint, then we realize that our human history has been stripped away. We're not allowed to know about these things. We're just not allowed to to read about it or, you know, most of it's been removed from us. And even the bones that have been dug up here in the States, nobody knows what happens to them. And yet in the, uh, I think I mentioned this before on your last show, that we've got uh, basically evidence in the New York Times in the, in like around 1882, I think is the first one I've read about, where these bones were given to the Smithsonian for national study. And then you call the Smithsonian and ask to see the bones, they don't have them. So I believe this is like forbidden knowledge. It's something that we're not allowed to know about, and the reason for that seems pretty clear to me. That well, these they're still here, still messing around with with humanity, but they're doing it more in a secretive, clandestine fashion now. Well, I, I think this all ties together. There's so many pieces of the puzzle, but when we put them to done, and everybody's got some revelation here, and this. Being um, the Passover week when we're recording this, um, you know the feast of pa- Passover has been stolen as well, because <laughs> the enemy wants you know blood. He wants to give us a bloodless religion. Um, it, it, we should see something. You know, when when we're understanding the celebration of Passover uh, as communion, we come together. Remember God's great work and of redemption and. You know, declare the power of redemption in our lives today, that we live a life that's glorifying to God. Something should happen inside us. I mean, God does watch over his word to perform it. Um, we see this over and over again in the scriptures. And it's interesting that, you know, the, the church, um, after a couple hundred years, um, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the history. Um, Rome came in and didn't want anything to do with the, the Jewish part of it. Um, kind of severed those things, and, and today we've you know had something replaced. We've um, it's it's sad when we kind of look at what's going on today. I mean, if we really get down to it, um, I saw in, in Exodus um, twenty three thirteen it says, "And all things that I've said unto you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, neither let them be heard out of your mouth." Well, that's an interesting scripture when we contemplate that because studies are showing that like. You know, maybe 50% of professing Christians, and including men and women, are uh, addicted to pornography. Um, what a sad statement. And I'm thinking, like, is that really any surprise when, you know, at the beginning of um, the, the beginning of the biblical feast here, that, that people are lifting up a fertility goddess? <laughs> I mean, it just... It's, it's, it's amazing to see how this has taken roots here. We've, so, you know, if you want to get rid of something, you're going to dig it up by the roots. So it's encouraging believers to partake in ancient god, you know, a goddess rituals, the sunrise services, the, the coloring of the, the Easter eggs and Easter hunts and stuff. It's kind of like people justifying the Halloween <laughs> thing, you know? Um, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's like we have these these strange uh, traditions, e- hunting for Easter eggs and, and yeah. putting up Christmas trees and hanging Christmas balls and decorations. And, you know, uh, and then Halloween is probably, at least in Hollywood, is probably the biggest <laughs> people uh-huh. go all out for Halloween out here. I mean, I've seen some incredible Halloween demonstrations. I mean, just like where people converted the roof of their houses into a sheer projection system where they reenacted parts of the Wizard of Oz. Mm. And I just, I, I mean, they had camera cranes out in the middle of the street. And I'm going, unbelievable. <laughs> this is like big production. <laughs> so they do that out here for Halloween. They, it's yeah. not all evil stuff, but they'll, they'll do really cool, interesting stuff, I guess, because they figure anything goes on Halloween. But, you know, it's like Halloween always kind of creeps me out. It, it's like... Uh, we're celebrating like the evil side of everything, so it makes me feel pretty uncomfortable most of the time. So, yeah, we we'll read in Second Corinthians um, six fifteen. You know, it talks about what fellowship does Messiah have with Baal. You know, we should have none, and um, we shouldn't be mixing on uh, and merging his you know his ways with those of the world. 
which is the same thing that we see going on with the Nephilim. I mean, in fact, you know, Jeremiah 6, 16 tells us to choose the old path, you know, and find rest for our souls. But then it goes on to talk about how stubborn rebellion the people were in the congregation. They wouldn't do it. So, Well, what's, what's interesting is that um, humanity is, is, after the Tower of, of Babel happened, uh, humanity has has really not changed since then. There wasn't. Uh, we think that that there was a DNA thing that happened, where everybody's language was changed. Could have been a DNA upgrade, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a. I, I just have a belief. It's my own personal opinion. Uh, I'm not stating anything other than that. Um, that I think that the angels get involved when things like that happen. They know how to do it. And so if that's the case, and if some of what we're seeing in the, in the UFO phenomena is fallen angelic activity, then we would have to think that they know how to do it too. Because they're also angels. They're just the evil kind. But so it just all, seems to this all gets into like what they are able to do, what powers they have what intelligence they have um, and also things that are of a very high tech nature that are all part of this whole spiritual component. When, when I watched Walter 7 um, I guess well, I was out in Nephilim hunting with LA you know and showed me <laughs> a, a copy of it before it came out um, and there's that bit where you know they came in and, and the one person was in the bed and, and one was you know taken. Right. Right, isn't I mean, that, isn't that cool? <laughs> and there was all this radiation, and there's the, the you know where you got the you know you mentioned earlier where we were talking about the the handprints of the you know some alien yeah. substance on the wall. Well, I mean, the scripture talks about it in the end times. I mean, the enemy knows the the Bible probably better than a lot of Christians. He's been studying it for thousands of years. Um, well, yeah, exactly. Here's, it's here's like, that counterfeit, you know, of one will be taken, one will be left. I know, and that was I, when Roger said that, and I was listening to what he was saying again in editing, it just dawned on me. It's like he said it without really understanding Matthew 24. And then I thought, well, oh, this is a clue. This is how people are, are taken. It's the same way that they're abducted because it's mm -hmm. angels doing it. And Jesus tells us that there are angels coming to take people out. So they have the same way of doing it. So what does that mean? During an abduction, and, and this, is, this has happened to most likely millions of people all over the world have been abducted, and they don't want to talk about it because they think people will think they're crazy if they do. But the interesting thing is that what we see happening is that if they're in bed and they're abducted at night, then if they're sleeping with their partner, that other person that isn't abducted is paralyzed. The person that is abducted then is lifted out of the bed and is able to pass through walls, windows, ceilings. There's some kind of a molecular thing going on that we don't understand. And he's removed from the room. No, that's just exactly... So we're, 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 we read these passages in Matthew 24. Two will be working in a mill. One will be taken and the other left. Two will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Well, you'd always think, well, if someone's being taken, the one next to him would reach out and grab for him, but they won't be able to. They'll most likely be paralyzed. Mm. It, it, Isn't that fascinating? It, it very it much fascinates me. And it goes along with, you know, an, an axiom. Peter in, in prison, the angel comes and says, wake up. I mean, first of all, the fact that he was sleeping, knowing he was going to be executed the next morning, was kind of, a, a, you know, the peace of God that passes uh, understanding. <laughs> so yeah. he's sleeping. The angel wakes him up. He thinks he's having a vision. The, the chains supernaturally fall off. The prison doors open. The, none of the guards, are, you know, they're all like in a suspended animation or something. And and then next thing he knows, he's walking down the streets, you know, going, was that a, a vision, a dream? What happened? I'm, I'm free. Hallelujah. It's just like an abduction. And probably if we went into that prison with the test equipment we have today, we could measure an elevated level of magnetic flux density at that area where he was and during his path on the way out. It's This stuff 
is measurable with the equipment we have today. That's what's so amazing about it. It's not just spiritual hocus pocus. This stuff actually happened and is happening again in a different way. Not a good way, but a, a different way. And I, I really think that we're, when it actually does happen to us, those of us that know how this works really won't be all that surprised. It'll be like, oh, finally, it's happening to me now. Mm. You know, I, well, I think that's what it's going to be. I think that's why the church needs to prepare itself. I mean, that's really one of the reasons we should come together, study the scriptures like the Berean, and be prepared. In fact, you know, it says that faith is the substance of things hopeful. Well, that substance could actually be measured now scientifically. Yes. So, I mean, when we, we get into the neuroscience, um, we can measure substance of, of faith. So it's really, you know, I mean, just as it said, the scripture said, before he comes, there'll be an increase in knowledge. We're there. It's all happening now. Um, That's why I think that the return of the Messiah is has to be soon, because we're figuring this stuff out. And this is all prophesied in the book of Daniel. That in the last days, men will be running to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And that's what's happening. I mean, never in human history have people been this mobile to be able to jump on a plane in a couple hours, get you know, be a thousand miles away. Uh, we've never been able to do that. And, and even that is primitive in respect of alien technology, if you will, where, I mean, uh, the, being able to travel interdimensionally or across the galaxy and understanding how that works, we certainly aren't going to be shot in tubes full of rock, rocket fuel with flames coming out of them like Flash Gordon days. That's that's not mm -hmm. the way it's going to be. We're going to have the ability to understand gravity, levitation, uh, time travel, all of those things. And I was listening to um, a guy on Coast to Coast the other night who I know pretty, pretty well. Uh, I've seen him at many of our uh, UFO meetings that we've had, and he said there's there's really no way to separate the way these ships travel unless you get into a discussion of time travel. Hmm. So if that's the case, then the angels can travel through time. And I believe Jesus could as well. I believe that when Jesus appeared to his disciples after he rose, we're talking, it's Easter here, after he rose... He materialized in the room that they were at. Remember that? Which, mm -hmm. uh, especially as a kid, I really dug that passage a lot because that was like really almost like science fiction and really cool. Plus, it makes Jesus seem really hip, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and to a kid, you're like, yeah, that's really neat, you know. So then you're thinking, well, how did he do that? And and you know, he did a lot of things that were almost like just having fun with his disciples. I think at the mm -hmm. end there where he was kind of playing around with them and kind of sneaking up behind him and they didn't know who he was and they realized it was him and he disappears because <laughs> he could do all that stuff now. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is the way eventually we all will be. I well, really it, sa do. it says we will. It says we'll have a glorified body like he. Um, so, yeah, these, these, these things are happening. Yeah. Um, uh, that That is... Uh, it is a fascinating thing to contemplate how he just was able to appear in the room, plus the fact, you know, being God incarnate, uh, knew what Thomas, Dotting Thomas had said, and walks up to him and repeats the conversation that he had, <laughs> tells him to, you know, put his hands in the in the, the wounds. Yeah, yeah, it's really, uh, you know, and, and for some for, for some reason he retained those nail holes uh, probably intentionally I I'm sure Jesus so. could appear any way that he wants to appear to anyone but he wanted that that was his mark of his love towards humanity and that was important to keep those those scars of that experience and I've often wondered you know what would it have been like if people had just said hey this is great we want to you know follow the words of Christ we, we want to be followers of Yeshua and wasn't crucified and the world would be a completely different place. We'd have all this high-tech stuff, we'd have 
and no one would have there'd be no taxation there'd be no evil government control uh, there wouldn't be infringement on our our liberties none of that stuff and someday that's the way it's going to be that's what i'm looking forward to that's why in the the famous lord's prayer um one of the one of the statements in that is that you know, thy kingdom come meaning that um let things be here on earth as they are in heaven because that's the way they're it's so cool in heaven and it would be great if all of that was the way it is here on earth and someday it'll be like that for a while at least well it it is and you know science is showing from uh, the neurosciences that uh, you know I wrote about it in my book what was i thinking uh, that the human brain is, is able to store over three million years worth of information well why would that be if we weren't designed to live forever so uh, well yeah and that's just um there's also um scientists don't really understand even what the human brain actually does whether it's a receiver of information or a storage of information or information's coming from some other place. I heard this story once, and I wish I could find it again, but there was this, this kid who was in college that was something of a math extraordinaire, and yet he had some social disabilities. He didn't really get along with the other kids very well, and... Yeah, he was really brilliant, but his head was really large. Hmm. And so his professor said, I'm just intrigued by the by the shape of your head. And I, you know, without, you know, making fun or anything like that, he asked this student if he could do some tests. And he said, OK, fine. So he x-rayed it and found out that this this uh, adolescent man had a condition where this fluid that um, is in your head that cushions your brain tissue, like when you bump your head, it, mm -hmm. you have this this cushion of, of fluid um, around your brain tissue, and his system was generating tons of that stuff to the point where it was enlarging his his head, his skull, his cranial area had had been enlarged to contain the pressure of all this fluid building up. But the interesting thing was it had, because of all the pressure in his head, it had compressed his brain matter down to the size of like a golf ball. So his whole head was full of fluid and his brain was tiny because it had been compressed. And yet he was doing all of this math and for the rest of his, he was fairly normal where you would think he would be like a vegetable. So then everyone was going, well, what does the brain actually do? If you can compress it down to that size and it's still functioning, where are we getting this information from? What's Where are these signals coming from and, and how are we able to... It, 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 to me, that was like an amazing story because we really don't know all that much about how we function and, and really what life is and what a soul is and a spirit is, those things uh, we haven't been able to learn how to measure yet. But I'm sure that as we get further into all of this, we'll find that even that it has some physicality to it, some scientific measurement ability that we just don't know how to do. Well, there, there certainly is a, a connection between the mind and uh, body, spirit, and soul. Um, these things. Uh, the only thing we can really rely on is the word of God. Um, absolutely, you know. It's, sure. It's, it's where we. Well, we draw also, what's a little creepy is that because of science and because of this uh, explosion of of all the things that are happening right now of, of intellect and knowledge that the Bible talks about. Um, we can do things that we've never done before. We can inject electronic signals into a human brain and just by putting electrodes on, the, on your temples, you can hear music playing. 
because they've figured out how to do that. And this is like something that that I heard was done during a desert storm back in 91, 92, when they basically sent signals into those areas. And remember how everyone just gave up? Mm. It was very strange. They just walked out and gave up because they were sending signals into their brains. And how would you do that? The only the only apparatus I know of that's powerful enough to do something like that would be harp where you bounce signals off the ionosphere to a localized place um, and send those frequencies at a strong enough level to where you could control people. Now, once that kind of thing happens and the government gets evil enough to do that to everyone living on the planet, that's a level of control we've never seen before, and I hope it never happens. Some some years ago, I had a friend in Ireland that wrote a book on genetic engineering, and she had um, told me how she saw an, ex- an experiment where the Russians were able to stop a raging bull in, in its in its charge uh, using microwaves, some device they had back then, and that would have been you know uh, early eighties, late seventies, something like that. Yeah, sounds like the the heat ray that they have that they can. They can aim it at people and uh, through a whole, you know, crowd that's a mob, that mob violence kind of thing, and they can aim this antenna at them, and, and everyone feels like they're burning up, so they have to get out of the area. So that's done with microwaves. It's almost like like your microwave oven kind of deal, except mm-hmm. it, I don't think it goes under the skin. I think it just is a surface kind of thing. Right. Well, unfortunately, we're at the end of the time. Rick is signaling me that we need to. Uh, Boy, that this went program. fast. It did. We'll have to do this again. This is fascinating, <laughs> Richard. It's crazy stuff we're talking about here. Well, um, I just thank you so much for coming on again. Let's set up another time and, and cover some more areas of uh, interest for everyone. And uh, all I can say right now is this: being the Passover week, you know, um, the Lord. Jesus Yeshua said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So let's carry on and do that. God bless you, Richard. Thanks ever so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Casper. On behalf of the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries, we want to take this moment to thank you ever so much for listening. If you want to get closer to God, and be blessed in all good things. Simply make Him the Lord over all your life, not just the convenient parts of life. Now's a good time to surrender all your life to the Lord Jesus. If you draw close to God, He tells us He draws close to you. So it's not just signing some salvation card, rather it's practicing every day to learn to obey the Word of God, because this is a narrow path and very few find it and stay on it. In fact, we read in Matthew 7, 14, it says, Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. See, the Lord created you for His pleasure, and you are truly awesome. So, just pray with your whole heart and faith now, and trust the Lord to do His part to save you, to restore you, to bless you, to heal you, work miracles in your life. In fact, why don't you pray with me right now, if you've not made a a commitment to the Lord or you need to rededicate your life, do it now. Say this with me. My Lord and my God, have mercy upon my soul, a sinner. Please forgive me for all the wrong things that I've done in my life and in my generations, going all the way back to Adam, as I forgive now all those that have wronged me and offended me, including myself. And I accept your forgiveness, Lord Jesus, and I make you the Lord of my life. And I truly believe, Father God, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Messiah Yeshua, is the Son of God, the living God, and that He died on the cross and He shed His blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And I believe that Jesus rose again from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost and He's forever alive. Papa God, I pray to you in the almighty name of Jesus now that you wash away all my sins because I understand that nothing but the blood of Jesus can make me righteous before you. And I invite you, Lord Jesus, be my personal Savior and help me follow after you the rest of my life. My Lord and my God, 
Your holy word says that you'll never turn anyone away that comes with a humble heart, and that includes me right here, right now. Therefore, I know that you've heard me, Lord, and I know that you've granted me salvation, and I know that I'm saved because of what the Lord Jesus accomplished on the cross. So now I qualify for blessings, and, and I qualify for healing to all my body, and to spend eternity with you. Father God, in Jesus' almighty name, I thank you for saving my soul this very day. Well, praise the Lord and congratulations if you prayed that with me just now. And welcome into the family of God. The best decision you've ever made. Won't you join us again next week here on The Fringe, same place and same time for more spiritual encounters. And if you've got anything you'd like to ask, or a prayer request, or if you'd like to be considered to be a guest, please contact us on the web at the Upper Room Fellowship in Casper McLeod Ministries. And I pray the Lord's supernatural peace, healing and provision and protection cover you always with oceans of a godly love. This is Pastor Casper. I know that I pray blessings on you always in the almighty name of Jesus. Jesus, save my soul. Jesus, save my soul. Oh